Disha is an attempt of NASCOM to provide mentorship to SMEs from successful business leaders. Disha, in the true sense, has helped more than 100 plus SME founders in their growth strategy and business expansion. Today, through this session, we would like to give a glimpse of leaping into the future live Disha, live Disha session with Dr. Ganesh Natarajan. I would like to invite Dr. Ganesh Natarajan, founder and chairman, 5F World, and Samir Jain, founder and CEO, Net Solution, for this exciting mentorship session. Thank you so much. We have uh, exactly 23 minutes because uh, Ganesh has to leave. So we'll get right down to it. Ganesh, uh, when, before coming on stage, I think one thing you said that I want you to double click on, you said it's going to be extremely difficult to grow in this tough market. Could you talk about that, please? No, I wouldn't say it's extremely difficult, but I mean, we all know this. I mean, morning, I'm just coming out of a big mm -hmm. bank meeting. And if you look at the banking system collapse in US and Europe, it's almost reminiscent of when I was chairman of NASCOM in 2008. And if you remember, the subprime crisis happened. And that time I was there in Capitol Hill meeting senators and meeting Wall Street guys. And the first question that asked was, will the IT industry decline by 10% or 15% this year? Because the global economy was crashing. And I was pretty confident that there are some companies that have the growth mojo. So I said, look, we may not grow double digits this year, but we'll certainly grow in single digits. And actually, that year, we grew 5.5%. So I'm saying it's a tough market. OK, we are finding, I mean, whether anybody admits it or not, 50% of the so-called unicorns, and somebody was saying in a very unglamorous way, have become cockroaches. Why cockroaches? Because they're scurrying around and trying to find places to hide their cash. Because Silicon Valley Bank has collapsed. So in a situation like this, where many of the unicorns are coming down and losing value like crazy, the question that you have to ask yourself is, how do I still grow? And my belief is the real winners for the next 15, 20 years will be absolutely companies who can find that mojo. And I'll, I can maybe talk about it a little later, because I've done that myself. I know what it takes to be successful in this market. Sorry, I, I missed that. You said uh, companies that will survive will do what, sorry? OK, let me answer that question. I mean, and I'll give you an exa actually example. Because I've been living in Pune for the last 22 years. And I remember I came here off a very successful stint building this company called Aptech, which we actually built from seven training centers, five in Bombay, to 1,400 training centers, 42 countries, 24 of which we became market leaders. And in a sense, it was my first CEO stint. I was 31 years old when I became CEO of Aptech. So it was purely because there was nothing to lose. And that's really how we succeeded. But then I came into a completely different sector, which is IT, um, so software services. And again, thanks to NASCOM, because I joined the NASCOM Executive Council 1995, thanks to Devang Mehta kind of bulldozing me to join. And right through then, being part of the NASCOM Executive Council Chairman's Council, and a lot of good mentoring, good counsel from people like Harish Mehta and Ashang Desai and so many others. So they kind of convinced me, saying that, look, if you're getting a chance to be in the software exports industry, why don't you take it? So I came to Pune. This was a 40 crore company, which of course had morphed from being a hardware company to a software company. That was about the time, if you remember 2001, when the whole dot-com business had collapsed and B2B became back to Bangalore and B2C became back to Chennai. And this was happening to most people. And I remember, and I was very amused when Namita said in that slide, that you know, SME businesses typically want to sell to SMBs in the US. And this is the exact advice I got saying that, look, if you're a small 40 crore company, don't punch above your weight. Try and find companies which are in the, maybe in America, 500 million to 2 billion, and sell to them. So I still remember we got, my, we got our team together, and this was just about, we had about 250 people. And I got the leadership team together and said, look, guys, what do we want to become? And as I said, this was middle of the dot-com crisis, three months before Osama bin Laden would come and do what he did to the World Trade Center. But still, the team said, look, we don't want to go chasing small customers. We have to do only work for Fortune 500s and FTSE 100 companies. Now, it's a grand statement to make. So to answer your question, so what did we do? Because when I left, we were a 4,000 crore company. And in fact, the last five years, 2011 to 2016, our market value on the Bombay Stock Exchange was growing 44% per year. So clearly, we did something right. 
and i think what we did right was we said we have to have a different point of view why on earth would a max and spencer or a cisco or a fujitsu or a danaher all of whom became clients of ours listen to a little 40 crore company out of a at that time unknown destination called pune so we went around and said we actually bought the ip of a little company in silicon valley called calki software and we built a story for zensar which was that we do programmerless programming now what the heck is that what it meant was this is days before rational and everything else came in we said you just tell us your use case and we'll do diagramming and mapping and we will generate java code and dotnet code and i still remember we wrote to about 100 of the fortune 500 companies just found out the name of the cios and wrote to them and we got exactly three replies three and a half i would say because one guy replied saying don't be silly just go away okay but the other three said mm, interesting we'll talk about it and i remember and i still remember the name this guy called stuart senior who was the it director of marx and spencer london he wrote to me saying okay next time you are in london i mean do drop in we can have a chat so i said oh by the way stuart i'm actually planning to be in london next week which was complete bs but anyway so we flew down to london and there we were and uh, we told him about this whole new product we have and we said look you know programming is now passe and we got to do this stuff and i remember stuart looking out of the window and saying yes and pigs will fly one day you know <laughs> that was the extent of belief he had but sure enough three weeks later he called me up and said look you guys said you have this magic box so i have a big application in foods and we're going to give it to our favorite european vendor who i won't name our favorite indian vendor and we'll give it to you also so show me how your magic box works so we said how much time do we have he said i'll give you 3 weeks to deliver the solution so i asked my cto very bright guy called dilip pithera some of you may know him He's very active in nascom even today and dilip said boss this is too important for us to risk with our technology let's do it the hard way let's hire programmers so we hired 40 programmers we all worked round the clock and 3 weeks later we sent it to stuart so stuart called up and said look i'm i'm going to tell you that out on a seven out of eight parameters you guys were better than competition typical indian the first question was what is the eighth one on which we were not good he said you don't know english football as well as the english so we said that we learn don't worry sir and that was our beginning and we got cisco to trust us with a little 70000 dollar deal when i left cisco was 140 million dollars a year account for us so the point i'm making is if you if you keep going around and saying oh i'll work with the small boys i will be the cheaper and there are three companies in pune which grew to 200 million by being the cheaper version of zensar now i mean good luck to them I mean, if you can do it being cheaper than somebody else great i mean today i mean i don't know if anybody from tcs is here tcs can do anything that any of us can do and do it cheaper also okay that is the strength of a company like tcs and you think you will compete with tcs on price no way so you have to have that point of view so the point of view the business model to scale which really means that look you can sit here and talk till the cows come home but my favorite marketing professor in harvard business school used to say that look you can build the world's biggest mouse trap but nobody will automatically come and beat a path of gold to your door you have to sell the damn thing okay so sales becomes extremely important so if you have a business model that takes a slightly disruptive idea takes it to the market and of course don't screw up on execution i think you can make it happen so when i hear all this I mean, don't believe the proverbial thing because if you if you work with only with small companies, the small company will go bust. Every year you'll be chasing your tail and looking for business to replace other business. Make some big bets, make some big customers, and believe me, when I left Zensar, 97% of our business of 400 million dollars was coming from Fortune 500 companies, and we never had to budge from there. And it's not that it can't be done; it's just a question of saying what is it that we can do, are good at, can be very good at. and then you'll scale okay uh, so staying on that uh, selling point i think one of the big questions and many times we've heard uh, in disha uh, is the question about uh, companies being based in india and yet their customers are in the us so, uh, so how do they sell what is that they can't afford to hire someone in the us they're sitting here in india What's you should ask my best you should ask my best friend anand deshpande about it. okay because anand is a classic case study of a guy who for the first 20 years and persistent and zensar were big competitors in those days today hats off to persistent because zensar is still about 500 million and persistent is a billion so clearly he's done something phenomenal with this company but anand was very clear saying i am the ceo i am the founder i am salesman number 1 any customer wants to see me i'll be on a plane and see him next morning 
I did the same thing. I mean, for, for the first 10 years of my stint in Zensar, I was traveling like 25 days a month. And I still remember about, you know, when we had become about 200 million, uh, we, and we used to do this every year, kind of call all our customers to campus, and really take care of them, wine and dine them, et cetera, et cetera. And we had a panel discussion. And I remember, you know, talking to customers. And the pan in the panel, we said, what should Zensar be when it grows up? And one of the customers very succinctly said, we want you never to grow up. I said, what does that mean? He said, look, anytime I want to meet you, and this guy was from South Africa, you will be there next month. And that access to the CEO is what we like. So he didn't care whether I was based in US or UK, or so long as he could see me when he wanted to see me. I think as, as CEO, I was salesman number one for the first 10 years. So the answer to your question is, I mean, today when I hear stories of, you know, like my own successor, God bless him, took the entire cost structure of Zensar from Pune to San Jose, California. And the profits like plummeted like nobody's business. I mean, that's, I mean, it's public knowledge, so I'm telling you this. So you have to be very careful. What does it, what does it, what does, what really needs to be done in the market and what can be done out of India? And I think that is the combination. I mean, have you ever heard of a TCS CEO based in the US? No, no. Have you ever heard of an Infosys CEO being based in the US? No. So it's because you feel that, look, if you have the right mojo in your sales model, you can pretty much do anything. So don't worry about, I'm not in the US, so I can't sell to that market. As Stuart Senior told me, learn enough about American football and ice hockey, et cetera, so that you can do the calls. But don't worry about where you're based. And this, the confidence is to come within yourself. I think you've already answered that question. But uh, you know, one of the things that people ask is, oh, should I hire a Gora? Should, should I hire an Let Indian? me answer this question. By the way, we had a brilliant model, which I must tell you. When I left, we had 27 sales guys in the US, all Goras. And to be fair, one African-American. So you can't generally say Goras. Okay, So it's American. Let me put it that way. All these Americans were primarily very good at whining and dining customers. Okay, Immediately behind them, we had a pre-sales and delivery organization in the US, just four people. But the minute the guy got an inquiry, the next call he would get was from a Ramani or somebody else who was this pre-sales organization. And within one year, the sales, sales would be transferred back to Pune. So the account management would then happen from offshore. So by this model, we left. I, I still remember my favorite uh, sales guy, a guy called Armin Ermsland, a very typical American. And he used to handle one of our biggest accounts in Milwaukee in the US. And I used to tell, when I used to go, I said, Armin, have you learned anything about what we do in Zensar? He says, Ganesh, you want me to be bad in sales? Don't tell me anything about what we do. I said, but then, I mean, you're the most successful sales guy. You're doing 15 million a year, for heaven's sake. This is my job is to find out where the best single malt uh, shops are in, in Milwaukee. I go every Friday, take all the customers out, and we have a great singing and dancing night. And Monday morning, I'm back in their office, and they say, what can I do for you? Then I call Ramani, and he will call up and sell them what he wants to sell. He said, this model is working for me brilliantly. So you need to be clear on who you use for what. But, and I still remember when I was in NIIT, and we actually, there were four of us who actually built the first ingredients of what is today CoForge and became NIIT Technologies. And we used to joke about it, because we are a sales guy. And that time, we were selling this product called Sybase, which, by the way, was a competitor to Oracle. Most of you know that. And we had this guy. I still remember his name, but I won't tell you, because maybe he's still around. So, so And he used to be the world's biggest expert on Sybase. So he can go across to a customer, sit with him, argue about two-phase commit and three-tier architectures and da-da-da-da-da. At the end of it, he'll come back and we'll say, boss, order me like any. He said, oh, I forgot that. Because he won the argument. And the business went to Oracle. I'm like, come on, guys. So you know, you have to be very clear that your most Anand Deshpande is an exception. The best technical guy you can think of, and also the best sales guy. And he used to have all his buddies from IIT Kharagpur and IIT Bombay actually giving him business from Silicon Valley. Now, that's an amazing model. But in a model like this, be clear on how you want to structure your sales. And don't worry about whether the guy is white or black or brown or khaki. So long as he or she knows what they're supposed to do, you'll be successful. OK, uh, jumping on to a talent question. Um, so a lot of uh, our SMEs, they think they become training institutes. You know, they you know, hire freshers or whatever, train them. And as soon as they're ready, they jump the ship. So how do they get out of this cycle, according to you? I'm a bad person to ask questions about talent. because, And I'll tell you why. Because just three weeks back at the Asia Economic Dialogue, I was sitting exactly on this table, and opposite me was Narayan Murthy. 
And Murthy and I had this discussion on wonderful new terms like moonlighting and so on and so forth. And if any of you want, know, want to know, just send me an email. I'll send you the one and a half minute clip of our one hour conversation that went viral. But I asked Murthy that, look, what is your advice for people looking at talent? And he said what I expected him to say that, look, I mean, here we are trying to build a country which is a world beater. Mr. Modi is sleeping four hours a night. Guys, you have to work hard. There is no substitute for hard work to take the old adage. And uh, then I, of course, had to poke him. So I asked him questions about moonlighting and gave him some examples, which is there on that video. And Moonsi said, look, I mean, I want people to come back to work. I want them to be disciplined. I want them to work hard in typical Narayan Murthy style. OK, and that went up, I think, brute or one of those social media popularizers put it on the on YouTube. And you'll be amazed. There were 42,000 downloads, 680 comments. Out of the 680, 678 were, I wish these two old men would die fast so that, <laughs> so that young people can have a good time. How do you manage talent, boss? Pune, when COVID happened, my wife is a complete dragon and she runs our business. So we have about 440 people working in Pune. And everybody said, oh, you know, Modi has said work from home, curfew, band karo, etc., etc. So she said, okay, fine, no problem. Six weeks, Prime Minister has announced nobody can come to office. Work from home. So people said, oh, I'm going back to Sangli, I'm going to Satara. Said, excuse me, excuse me. You came to work in the city of Pune. You're living somewhere, obviously, maybe in the railway station, maybe not. Please continue to be in the railway station or wherever you are and work from home. Mr. Modi has not said you have to go back to your hometown. So people said, ha, yeah, we have. So they started working. You know, most bachelors who come to the city, four people staying in a one-bedroom apartment. The minute the curfew thing got, we started getting calls. Boss, please office kholo. Can you double the space we work? After that initial period of six weeks, and then I think three weeks into 2021, we were working merrily from office. Our social sector, our social thing, which is a very big thing in Pune called Lighthouse Communities, everybody came to office. So, and we never had the problems that I'm facing and seeing in Bangalore today. I mean, today, if in Bangalore, people are not coming to office on Friday because it's before Saturday. They're not coming on Monday because it's after Sunday. And then maybe Tuesday also will take off. So, Wednesday, maybe we'll think of going to work. So, if you go to Bangalore on a Wednesday, and I'm sure all you Bangaloreans know it, it's complete chaos, man. I went to do a book talk two weeks back, four minutes from the Honeywell campus, where I was doing a board meeting, to the Bangalore International Center in Alsur took me one hour and 22 minutes. I mean, there is no place worse than this place. Okay. Because it was on a Wednesday afternoon and everybody had come to work on that day. Thank goodness. Okay. So my philosophy is very simple on talent. Find people who are realizing that, look, the, the dot-com quadrupling of salary that they experienced is not going to happen. And they'll come down to earth and work hard. Because you cannot build your companies with talent which is kind of capricious and saying that, look, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was doing a, a session in one of the well-known technology institutes just three weeks back. The guy says, do you have a work, work from home policy? You haven't even taken up your first job for heaven's sake and you're saying work from home? Give me a break, man. Now many of you are thinking this guy should be dead. Okay, this also. So are services still relevant or should we move to building a product? That's a question very frequently asked. I was telling Samir that every time I open my mouth, there are five more people in NASCOM who hate me. But, <laughs> but fortunately, I have very good friends, Malik and Hanuman and this long-haired guy called Paresh, whom I used to know one time back, and Chetan. So they will forgive me. See, we keep saying services are dead. I have, in my 30-year tw career in technology, every five years, somebody, some analyst, some press guy, Economic Times, even yesterday I got a call saying, now that all the banks are collapsing, Will the IT services industry collapse? Like, come on, guys. We've seen every problem you can see, and we've still succeeded. No, I am a great believer in product, and not only product, but platforms. If any of you is building a good digital platform, like Nandan Nilakani has so brilliantly done with UPI, and now the Ministry of IT is talking about doing across agriculture, SME, circular economy, everything. It's a great idea. But remember, you've got to scale it. You know, three or four anecdotal things that look my product is doing so well here, etc., is not going to work unless you're able to scale. So scale the deep tech, scale the products, but don't forget that if you have a good solid services company and you have five great customers, you can do pretty much what you want. In fact, our own model was, and even this, this was a time when people said, look, you have to specialize. I mean, if you're doing only, if you're doing, let's say, AI and analytics, just be an AI and analytics shop. I'm not, not that's today, but in those days it was something, it was Oracle. We were an Oracle shop. 
we chose, again, it's an unconventional thing, saying we'll do a follow the customer model. Now, what does follow the customer model? How did Cisco grow from $300,000 to $140 million? Because we told Cisco, boss, you're working with Capgemini and Accenture, and, uh, and uh, Accenture was their big partner, and of course, Infosys and TCS and everybody else. We said, look, whatever you want us to do, do not hesitate to ask. And I remember then we grew the business from 2 million a year to about 27 million in about three years. And we got a strange call one day from the chief operating officer of Cisco, saying we're having a big problem, folks, which you know we can't, you can't help, but I mean, can you find us somebody? We have 1,300 conference rooms around the world, and we want somebody to help us in scheduling the conference rooms. So we all looked at each other and said, my God. And we said, we'll do it. So we had a 40 people BPO team doing conference room scheduling for Cisco. Of course, we built algorithms and software, and people used to say, what are you guys doing? I said, look, boss, we just want seven good customers. We'll build a half a billion dollar business. I mean, when I left, it wasn't seven billion, but I mean, seven customers were contributing 70% of the revenues. So the point I'm making is, if you have a good services model, you have a great, uh, great customer base, then you can pretty much do products, IP, accelerators, what have you. But if you're starting out saying that, look, I will build, build the best mousetrap in the world, then you better make sure that you have a good funding runway. And let me just stop by saying that, look, my belief is any company, and I've talked about the great idea. Great idea, great business model, make sure your capital doesn't run out. Today, why, the reason I said cockroaches is because a lot of people are scurrying around. The capital is drying out, and some of the very, very big PEs and VCs, which I will not name here, are actually struggling to stay afloat. So in a situation like this, Planning for your capital runway, not just from where you will get the next 2 million from, but what do you need over the next 10 years? When will you need the next uh, Series A, Series B? And at least having a tentative plan for that and having a great business management team. I mean, we all know that, that you know, visionary CEOs can only last for so long. You've got to build that sustainable organization. And finally, great customers. So customers, capital, good management team, great idea, business model. If you can tick off all those saying that, look, I'm better than average on all five, I think you'll build a great company. I won't worry about it. And so by the way, I'll make an offer to any of you. Any of you want to have a 10, 15 minute chat and tell me about what you do and say that, look, this is what, uh, what do you think? I'm happy to do it. Don't be devastated by what I tell you. So, so long as you're fine with that, it's fine. Because if I think you have a shitty model, I'll tell you you have a shitty model. So don't call me if you, if you don't want to hear the truth. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. You have no, no, go ahead and let him finish his questions. Oh, we, we just have two minutes. So, uh, so as a small business founder or owner, I, I get pulled in all different directions. Uh, you know, how should I be spending my, my time? Where should I be focusing the most? He's selling, 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 selling all the time. The five companies I've invested in here in Pune, by the way, are all where the sales guy, I mean, the CEO and these CEOs are age group ranging from 23 to 57. And the 57-year-old is on the road all the time. I mean, there is no solution. I mean, you just have to make sure that the hard work that you do in as a CEO. I mean, unless you are a solid techie who is God's gift to mankind, then you can hire the best sales guy and make it happen. But you all know what happened to Apple Computer. You know, you are, we all have read the story of Steve Jobs and John Scully. At the end of the day, the great entrepreneur cannot be substituted by a by a by a Salesperson. briefcase wielding sales guy. Mm. You have to go out and sell. There's no solution to that. There's no answer. There's no substitute for that. So one minute to go. Uh, what's, the, what's your final advice for SMEs or any my final, final My final use of the one minute to ask the lady ask the question. Go ahead, ma'am. Somebody give her a mic here. Yeah. Hi, Ganesh. Uh, this is Asifa here from Essential File Learning Solutions. Uh, my question to you is uh, actually two questions. Number one is you talked about talent and you know the work from home. Now most companies are going to uh, you know back to office, uh, but largely the millennial crowd is talking about work from home, and like you said, the moonlight uh, concept. So are companies thinking of you know really moving into the model of work from home? Because don't you think that would be also better for them to work harder? Currently, they are not ready to come back. Okay. No, let, me, let me answer this question. And uh, I have a friend who, by the way, runs a company in San Francisco. And he has now disbanded all his offices. And he'll say, we'll move purely to work from home. So he now employs people right from Russia to Ukraine to, uh, to Latin America. And he's built a model where work packs can be given out. And they're monitoring it extremely well. My problem still is the people who say that, look, whenever I feel like my head is aching, can I work from home today? I'm sorry. Please plan it. 
I mean, if you have a model you've designed which says that two days a week this person can work, like Deloitte, for instance. I mean, the biggest, the audit, the person who audits uh, Honeywell Automation, which I chair in India, I mean, she's very clear. She said, look, Deloitte has cut down their offices in the audit team by half. She's a very senior partner in the firm. She gets to use her office Monday, Tuesday, and half of Wednesday. Another very senior partner uses Wednesday afternoon, Thursday, Friday. And they say, look, we are completely decided what we'll do as work from home, etc. If you've designed your model, fine. But if you're succumbing to the millennials saying that, look, you know, I will quit unless you let me work from home, you're going to screw up your company. So make, make, decide what model you want and make it up. In our case, we've decided people will work from office because we do a lot of collaborative work. Social sector doesn't work by people sitting and, and calling beneficiaries from home. You've got to be out there in the slums, make stuff happen. It doesn't work otherwise. So to the last point, last point, Samir, and I'll finish with that is I think... Sir, I, I have one more question. I, no, no, I you had one question. question. <laughs> okay. The, the, the okay. other question, you can email me. So the point I'm making is, absolutely it's a tough market. Don't fool yourself. Don't, don't let anybody say, no, 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 it's very easy. You can easily raise $2 million. And most, most of you are SMEs, so you're not really that small. And I remember I started the SME council in India. And then I moved to Pune. Kiran Karnik had just become president of NASCOM. And he said, what, what is it we can do new? I said, look, boss, I grew from an SME to a larger company. Let's make life meaningful for the SMEs. And I think every, as you all know, the, if, you, if you know anything about economics, all major economies, including Germany and Japan, have been built by SMEs. Not like Korea, where it's a chai bowls like Samsung, et cetera, et cetera. So the future belongs to you. But if you don't recognize that, and if you don't say that, look, I'm going to seriously build companies like a Zensar or a Persistent or so many others which started small and upscaled, then you're missing an opportunity. So my last submission to you is take that opportunity, take advice. I think this Disha mentoring idea is a great one. Let your mentor guide you. Of course, don't listen to the mentor all the time. Because sometimes mentors will tell you that when I was a little child, I used to do this, you know, please. But your little child days have gone long back. So have your own antenna saying, what should I do at this time, at this place to build my business? And then you'll be successful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ganesh. Thank Thanks a lot. What a wonderful session. Kudos to both of you for such an insightful discussion. Really appreciate it. So here's a small token of gratitude from our end.